Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is the 19th of August of 2020, and I'm going to be discussing giving patients who have severe metabolic acidosis, I'm going to discuss giving them bicarb, or in this case, bicarb drips, to try to get them better and save some lives. Just like all my other podcasts, this one has citations, so check the show notes for links to the articles and the references that I'm using to say what I'm going to say. Because ultimately, none of this is medical advice, but it is substantiated by data. And you should definitely double check the data and not trust me. The logic to give patients bicarb when they have a metabolic acidosis kind of makes sense. I mean, you have an acid, you add a base, it should kind of equal out. At least, you know, make the numbers look pretty. But what's the data behind this? Is it beneficial? Is it ineffective? Is it harmful? And for that, we have to look a little bit further back into history because um, I'm, relatively speaking, a newly trained person, being that I graduated fellowship about three years ago now. But people who are more old school, so to speak, have a different way of thinking things. And we have to understand why they think these things and not get mad at them, but more so educate them. But looking at the data, even in 1986, There's a paper in one of the Annals of Internal Medicine which state that intravenous administration of sodium bicarbonate worsens rather than alleviates the metabolic and hemodynamic consequences of lactic acidosis. Then, in 1991, in Critical Care Medicine, which is one of the flagship journals for critical care, one of the studies concluded that the administration of sodium bicarbonate did not improve hemodynamic variables in patients with lactic acidosis. So if you're from that time period, that's what you're reading, that's what you're going to believe. And even more recently in the year 2000, in chess, there was a publication where they concluded that they did not give nor advise giving bicarbonate infusions regardless of the pH for patients who had an underlying metabolic acidosis. So take these things into consideration from a historical perspective. You understand why giving bicarb to the old school uh, clinicians or practitioners while giving bicarb to patients with a lactic acidosis or a metabolic acidosis was not something that was favorable. The tide started changing after the year 2000, when in 2001, Dr. Jeffrey Kraut, who was a nephrologist, published in the American Journal of Kidney Diseases that administration of large quantities of bicarb might prolong survival sufficiently to allow treatment of the underlying cause of the lactic acidosis. And this has been the way that administering bicarb has made sense to me as a clinician. Just temporize the pH, make sure that the pH is over 7.2 so that the vasopressors work, so that the patient's as hemodynamically stable as possible. Then you can find the cause of the underlying hemodynamic uh, deterioration and make the patient better. In the year 2012, additional recommendations were made by nephrologists that stated to consider giving patients base therapy, in other words, bicarb, when the systemic blood pH was less than or equal to 7.1 or at levels less than or equal to 7.2 in the presence of underlying cardiovascular disease or evidence of hemodynamic compromise. You might ask yourself, what's what's the big deal of even giving bicarb in lactic acidosis? Well, you need to watch out for intracellular acidification. And this happens because there's an accumulation of CO2 which happens with rapid boluses of bicarb. That's one component. I'm going to go down this road a little bit further in a couple moments. In addition to that, there's a pH-dependent decrease of ionized calcium that you need to watch out for. So the next question is, where's the data to support doing this or not doing this? Where's the sexy randomized control trial that tells us how to practice giving patients sodium bicarb? Should we do it? Should we not? What should we do? Fortunately, on July 7th, 2018, in The Lancet, a study was published that's called Bicar ICU. And the title of the article is Sodium Bicarbonate Therapy for Patients with Severe Metabolic Acidemia in the Intensive Care Unit, hence the sexy acronym Bicar ICU. This study is free to download. Please check it on the show notes. Read it for yourself. It's one of these landmark trials that you really, really should know about. This was a randomized control trial that took place in France in 26 different ICUs. They enrolled a total of 389 patients in this trial. And what they did is that they randomized these patients to get either zero bicarb as a control group or 4.2% IV bicarb infusion. 
And for reference, usually the bicarb drips that come pre-mix that you could get from the pharmacy or what we usually order as isotonic bicarb is uh, 150 milliequivalents of sodium bicarb in a dextrose bag. Well, this is the equivalent of just one amp of bicarb, 50 milliequivalents in one liter of solute. And what they did is that they ran this fluid between 125 to 250 cc's per hour up to one liter. Now, one of the things that would make it more challenging to prove any type of improvement in these patients is the fact that 24% of the control group received bicarb in one way, shape, or form. In the introduction, the authors cite the fact that having a pH that is sustained underneath 7.2 carries a mortality rate of as high as 57%, which is pretty bad. So we need to get patients out of this acidosis as quickly as possible. The authors also chose to go down the road of doing this study because like we had thought before and the people interested in this topic, it has been controversial whether you should give patients with a underlying acidosis or lactic acidosis, whether you should give them bicarb or not. Because as they stated, no studies to date had examined the effects on clinical outcomes of giving patients sodium bicarb. The authors ended up rounding up quite a sick group of patients. In all these patients, the pH was less than or equal to 7.2, and the SOFA score was greater than 4. Turns out that over 50% of the patients in this study had septic shock. The lactate of these patients was pretty high. It was even higher in the bicarb group, which would make things, you know, a little bit more challenging to prove a benefit, as the lactate in the bicarb group was 6.3 millimoles per liter, and the lactate in the control group was 5.3 millimoles per liter. And it turns out that 47% of the patients enrolled in the study had stage 2 or stage 3 acute kidney injury. So let's look now at the outcomes. Looking first at the primary outcome. And again, guys, this is my interpretation of things, so please read this study for yourself. But the primary outcome was a composite outcome, which was a combination of death by day 28 and greater than or equal to one organ failure at 7 days. And in the overall population, the 389 patients enrolled in the study there was no statistically significant difference for the composite outcome, nor 28-day mortality, although there was a trend to a benefit, but the p-value was only 0.07. And there was no difference in organ failures in one day. But when you look at patients who had an AKIN score, and AKIN stands for Acute Kidney Injury Network, when they had a score of 2 to 3, which ended up being 182 patients in the study, here's where we saw a benefit. The composite outcome was statistically significant with an improvement for the bicarb group. Now, if you break apart that composite outcome into two different things, 28-day mortality, patients who received the bicarb drip, and again, we're talking about one amp of bicarb in a liter of fluids for a maximum of one liter, okay? The 28-day mortality was decreased with a number needed to treat to save one life of just 5.9. And patients had fewer organ failure at day seven, which is... Pretty darn impressive, if you ask me, for such an inexpensive, uh, such an inexpensive treatment, I guess you could say. But now let's look at the positive secondary outcomes. In the whole population, and again, I'm not cherry picking certain people, in the overall population of 389 patients, there was a decrease in the, in the need for renal replacement therapy in the ICU. But then those patients who needed renal replacement therapy, well, yeah, they started it later on. But wait, there's more. The patients who received bicarb had more vasopressor-free days than the control group. And overall, in patients with the Aiken scores of 2 to 3, again, the 182 patients, had a decreased dependence on dialysis after ICU discharge. That means that if they got dialysis, it didn't necessarily mean that they continued on dialysis for the rest of their lives, which is phenomenal because... Dialysis as an outpatient is not where you want to be as a patient. As a quick aside, I don't know if I've mentioned this yet, but the two main causes for the acidosis was sepsis and hemorrhagic shock. So the next question I know you all are thinking, well, you all must be saying, okay, that sounds like a lot of good news, but what about some bad news? There has to be some sort of complication from all this. And in reality, the authors did not find any life-threatening complications but they did notice that there was an increase in metabolic alkalosis. My take on this is, you know, you're taking good care of your patient, you have to be on top of them, make sure that they don't develop this. In addition to that, some patients developed hypernatremia, which you could fix that. 
and some patients developed hypocalcemia, all things that you should be prepared for when you take care of these patients. But when you're taking care of a patient who has elevated lactate, and just to sum things up and to kind of finish this off already, don't forget to treat the underlying etiology of the patient's elevated lactate. Remember, the lactate is not the problem. The lactate is a signal that something bad is happening. Don't forget the underlying etiology. Also, don't forget about possible hypocalcemia. Check ionized calciums if you need to. Also, you may need to increase the ventilation on intubated patients. Don't forget that bicarb gets metabolized into CO2. So, CO2 causes acid, you know, go ahead and ventilate these patients better. Then, don't forget about the hypertonicity with some of the uh, bicarb solutions that we use. And don't forget to turn off the bicarb drip when you have achieved the desired pH. I think that's enough for today. Hope you guys enjoyed this breakdown of that article. Please let me know if you have any questions. Share this with your friends. If you're watching this on YouTube or any other format where you could subscribe, like, share with your friends, all that stuff, do it because it helps the channel and the podcast grow. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye.